All right, so uh, hey again, uh, this is a one-step webinar. Tonight's webinar topic will be land and uh, potential exit plans. Uh, give all of us here some uh, case studies and how we can exit from potential land and where typically we kind of get caught with it. And we're going to talk through some development workflow and land development uh, is about four examples. We have a little over half a billion dollars worth of asset under management. The number changed recently. We always say we shouldn't tell others what they should do. We should rather share with others what's happening in our court so we can learn together. All right, so uh, again, uh, th this is a one-step webinar. Uh, tonight's webinar topic will be land and uh, potential exit plans. And our goal is to give you guys, uh, give all of us here some uh, case studies and how we can exit from potential land and where typically we kind of get caught with it and also the conventional mistakes and the burns that we kind of go through, right? Um, a lot of the stuff that we have uh, that I will talk through those are the you know, best cases that we have uh, realized. Also, as we talk through it, I'll share with you some of the places that got us in a tight spot um, that also, you know, and, and that happened over time, right? So let's get started. All right, full disclaimer, we are not attorneys. Uh, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a CPA. Uh, I'm not an investment banker. All, all the things that we talk about in this webinar, it is purely uh, from our experience. So as you make investment choices, The right skill set that you have, right? Uh, okay. All right. So, uh, so tonight uh, agenda is the asset classes. Especially, we're going to focus on some triple net and some single family, and we're going to talk through some development workflow. Then, land development uh, is about four examples that I came about. Uh, the picture on the right is me and my gang. Uh, every summer, we go out for vacation, and that's that's one of the pictures that we took uh, this time uh, from Europe. Uh, it, it's impressive how we have operationally. Le uh, got leaned over time that we can travel for two or three weeks with the one hand carry on a backpack. That's all, all of and on. That's a reminder for us as you do our workflow, as we invest, we can optimize our workflow and the process. And that is one of the intent of this webinar. I'll give you guys enough examples and the case studies so you can make better choices. A little bit about us. Uh, Massive Capital is a vertically integrated uh, real estate company. Uh, we do two things uh, we do develop. Uh, of a class A triple net retail town centers. Uh, and also we own operate uh, multifamily value add assets. So we compete in a multifamily value add C to B minus, and we compete on a triple, uh, you know, on a class A via the new construction arm. On the right side, uh, the, those are our location of the assets. Everywhere in black, uh, we own assets that we're running and operating. And in a light gray that you have in Arizona, that's one of our market. And, uh, total, uh, we have two uh, companies who work together, uh, Capital and Realty One. Uh, between Realty One and us together, our we have a little over half a billion dollars worth of asset under management. The number changed recently. We are inching towards five and a half billion dollars right now. Oh, sorry, 5.5, but I mean, uh, one, 550 million dollars asset under management. Uh, so on the left-hand side, as you can see, uh, we raise equity from the LP investors, uh, and we also raise money from family offices. Uh, we have a couple of partnerships that funds us. Uh, we'll talk about some of the projects. Uh, then we have a triple net uh, leasing brokerage arm. We have five full-time employees. All they do uh, triple net leasing. Uh, we do land uh, development and steel frame construction in-house. And last but not the least, we have Massive Masters, uh, which is an education platform where we teach people how to become uh, sponsors of commercial deals or uh, and how to become a, you know, a stronger, uh, passive, actively passive investors, right? Okay, uh, so a little bit about, uh, so not this one. Uh, so this is our, uh, I kind of calculated since 2017 at the bottom right, you can take a look at it. We have invested over 343 deals and across all the asset classes. So most of our uh, conversation is from that. So we're not, we always say we shouldn't tell others what they should do. We should rather share with others what's happening in our court so we can learn together. So from the land side, we have done, the number went up almost 180 to 200 transaction, single family over 100, industrial, uh, SFR, multifamily, it's quite a bit out there. So all the things purely from the data perspective. And for us is not to, whenever we take a look at any projects, we spend more time to protect our money than thinking about making money, which is the conventional way of not thinking, right? So our job is to kill a project as fast as you can 
then whatever is left over that is worth doing rather the other way around every project is you know uh, investable then try to take out what is not right and we try to think a little bit differently outside the box as you kind of go through and i'll share with you as you kind of and as we talk through some of the examples all right uh, next slide so uh, we i have went through this uh, this workflow before, but I'm gonna you know, kind of go over that one more time, then I will rephrase it differently. So in a very simplistic sense, uh, the new development, uh, it's gonna be, we have a project that we, you know, we look at a piece of dirt, right? And we say, what is it that we're going to do with it? Uh, so that's that's where the project gets uh, started. So we, we start thinking about, uh, you know, one project and we kind of go, and then we scope it out. It is interesting, we put the inception and the scoping together because what we, what's the best use of that uh, property? That sets the stage of how much you're gonna pay for it, right? So we have a piece of property, uh, then we have different options. Do nothing, build a home, build a duplex, build an apartment, build industrial, build a, you can do a lot of things, right? Assuming rules will allow, but then depending on what we're going to do, that's gonna set the stage for how much you can pay, right? Because rent will set the tone for the uh, cost of the uh, land. Uh, once you have a scoping done, we get into the estimating and designing. This is a money pit. Oftentimes, we'll get excited about a piece of land and we get into a lot of rabbit holes, right? Rabbit holes means, I think I'm gonna do flex space, my best friend thinks, and our house, our cousin thinks, so we're gonna do duplex. Then we met somebody in a conference that said, I'm going to the apartment. All of a sudden, every little thing is costing you time and somewhat of your money. Uh, so having a team appropriately put together is very important as you go through. Once you get into estimation, you look, you're doing survey, phase one, phase two, talking to lenders, build a case that start costing you money. And once your design is fixed, you estimate you have a number that sets the tone for the scope. Then we're going to city approval and your construction, right? Uh, again, this is very, it's, it's the one, one of the highest risk uh, work is the city approval, especially the first time they give you a feedback. So what we call it is get the package for the design to get to the first feedback of the city. That's the most critical point. After that, it kind of kicks into the construction. Uh, once you're done with the construction, lease up is another thing, because remember here, project inception and the lease up, it's about two to three years out. So all the assumptions that we're making here, and we are realizing here, that whole two years of journey, it's, it's a, I mean, it's tough to see that far out. So when you buy an asset, when someone says you can do this, market comp is that, you'll be like, okay, that makes sense, but three years out, and we're taking all the risk. Whoever will take the risk, they will realize the benefit. So we always say just because my next door neighbor did something does not mean that I can pay for the same thing because I'm looking at that price after being done. Rather here, I'm, I'm a pre-construction, pre-approval, pre-everything. So when you look at a product, adjust it, and that's how we adjust it. So someone will say, this is the land price. You can build a space shuttle, the price is that. Then we'll break it out and we say to build a space shuttle, it takes a lot. So your price is that minus whatever it is. Then we exit, you know. So from here to here, um, you know, we have fastest you can do will be a single family. Longest you can do it's an apartment. Typically that's, or a town center, right? So that's that's the timeline. So it's somewhere from nine months to uh, five years, right? Depending on what you want to do. On that note, we always say, as you put together the project, a team must have a know-how. First time is extremely risky. First time for everybody, risky R. First time for everybody at a new project at a new location, highest risk that you can get. Uh, on the net worth of the team, uh, it is extremely important to have two to three X of the loan size. This will put the team in a very tight spot and it's gonna validate the team whether that's the right team or not. That's because we assume once, once a project is being done by one team, the same team will do another project. This type of loans are recourse. If you don't have the, you know, the balance sheet, it's a, it's a tough one. Liquidity, thing goes sideways all the time. I'll talk about it. And once you go sideways, the team has to be able to pay. If I scrape to get to a project where I needed million dollar loan, or there, I needed to raise $200,000 we raised, and, but I don't have a liquidity, and then one of the vendor 
slip to schedule and he needs to get a check, then I am out of, you know, breath. That is a lot of trouble. So we always kind of think it through. And one of the things that we totally don't talk enough about it is the risk money at play. Oftentimes you'll go through all this, we'll get to here, but then it's not going to make sense. Something changed, right? So whoever comes in, puts the team together, there are some real risk money at in place. It is much, much riskier on the land side than any other existing building, right? Existing building, you put the earnest money and you can exit out from the earnest money. And you can do some due diligence, a little bit of money, that's it. But on the land side, there's a lot of discovery, a lot of the hard cost. Those are not you know, low-end price, those are high-end price that you may not be able to recoup it if, if something goes sideways, right? So so team have to understand there is upside, but also there are some downsides. So you mitigate that as you go. And there are ways to mitigate it as you kind of go. And you know, I'll, I'll talk through some of the ways that we typically mitigate. So that's one framework. So what I will do now, I will reframe it and show you a different way. So make sure that you can, you can really absorb it, right? Um, that's the second one, right? So what we do to get to this round, the first thing is, uh, well, what are the steps? The first step is the feasibility and setup. Best and the highest usage, site planning and development, and construction. So if you take all of those steps, all of those eight steps, break it down to three, is the feasibility and setup, site planning and development, then you go construction, right? So that's the simplistic way uh, that, that we'll take a look at it. And then the second question is, okay, let's look at the first one. We have a land, what we can do with it? That's the limit. Uh, it is really the limit for, especially for the new people. It's a good thing and a bad thing. We always say play with your strength. Do what you know the best, do it again. Uh, venture out but not a whole lot, right? It's almost like driving. I'm driving in a lane. I can switch it to one or two lanes, but if I have to take a hard swing to four different lanes, I'm going to cause a lot of trouble. Um, you can buy large parcels, subdivide and sell smaller undeveloped lots. You can entitle lots. Uh, it is interesting uh, because you can, on the residential side, the entitlement has a value. In the flex space side, entitlement doesn't have a value. So it depends on you know, what we do. Then single family communities, you can entitle the whole thing, sell a lot to the builder, or you can build it by yourself. If a lot to a builder, build it by yourself, you gotta ask the question, do I have a road? Do I have utilities? What's gonna bring it? Price it accordingly. Again, residential multifamily, you can do triple nets, you can do neighborhoods, major anchor retail buildings, uh, part of a master plan. And then we go to mixed use, right? You can put a city center, you can do a master plan community by 1,000 acres at a time. And then school districts become important. Traffic becomes important. Flow of the growth becomes important. You can do flex space, storage, RV park, medical office. I mean, you can do a lot of things on this one. The question is, what is it? So, and each of them will cost you time and money. So I always, to going back to the point, when you have a piece of property, having the team who has been through four, five, six versions of it, and they should have an idea what the best thing to do, then you can go, right? So that's that's there. And the second thing is the land development. I'll bring this. So the land purchase, the zoning, the entitlement, the site prep, the utilities, construction, all will revolve around the land development and construction. So we have our internal risk factor that we use. Uh, I'll quickly show you how to read that slide. Uh, it's cash required. Land purchase from one to five. One is the most amount. Five is sorry. One is the least amount. Five is the most amount. It is uh, an additional amount. Effective is the highest risk, right? And availability of financing. It's about a three. So for the right set of people, financing available, and that we cannot go. And then, sorry. That, uh, for the zoning again, you know, money is needed over the grants company. Not a whole lot. Risk is extremely high. There is no financing. You got to play with your own money. Right, the entitlement the same way. Risk a little bit less because you went through zoning uh, already. Uh, money is need needed quite a bit. Uh, risk level is high, extremely high. As you can see, land purchase, zoning, and entitlement is the highest risk uh, work. And the money is not much available. Have to be from your pocket. And then when you get to the site prep, it gets easier. Risk is controlled, and you can see financing kicks in. 
financing kicks in, then they can do the whole project. So when you look at a project and the feasibility, you have to think it through, cash needed, risk level, financing activities, and what is your specialty? Each of those buckets and steps, that's a business by itself. People are running millions of dollars of business by itself. So it is detrimental to think we can run the whole circle all by ourselves and we'll be perfect all the time unless we're doing it all day long, right? So when you build your team, build your team that way. Are you fitting into the land purchase? Are you going to go through zoning? Are you going to go to entitlement here? If one could say, you know what? I always start here site prep. I buy everything entitled. There are teams that could say, I buy land by itself. I go through zoning and entitlement. I stop here. Some people could say, all I do, I work with the landowners, do the site prep and infrastructure. That's all. Their company could come and say, hey, I don't do infrastructure, but I only do construction. So as you build your team, you got to go through the whole thing and you got to go through the process. So developing land is fantastic. It's fun, but it's quite a bit that you have to go through. So as you look and uh, if you're, I mean, you, almost all of you guys investors here as a passive investor, you got to ask those questions and analyze the team. What's my confidence level? How many times, number one, they made the circle? Or how many times they have done each of them? That de-risks the know-how and you can develop that way. Uh, so some of the tools that we use uh, for, for the land that we take a look at it, we have an initial assessment and that we ask a bunch of questions that tells us what would that look like? It's the ownership and the legal and the utilities and the physical and the financial. If that works out, we get into a napkin underwriting that tells us what's, what we're going to build, what's the rent, what the cap rate looks like, very back of the envelope. If that works out, we go to detail underwriting and planning. If that works out, we get into texting. So uh, I would say 80, 90% of the time, this one doesn't pass. It's here. And then we don't even get into this one. And when someone sends a deal that they're going to do, we have to start here, then go this way and go that way. And then we kind of start from here, right? So for you, if you get into land development or if you're investing in land development, you can ask, hey, can you do a detail underwriting? Uh, can you share some of the planning? Can you share some of the initial assessments? So we can really understand which way to go, right? And also on that note, the one thing to remember, land development, it's a lot of paperwork especially first year. It's not like apartment that we can show you pictures every four months, how it's being changed, right? It's a, it's a very paperwork, very unsexy way of going about it. But once the construction hits, you get to see how it kind of comes through. So we'll talk about some of the projects year ago and now, right? So, so those are some of the tools we use, uh, some of the tools you should have. And when we communicate with the investors, we use a version of this where we have all the costs breakdown all everything else from the land acquisition cost, all the way down to total development cost. So you can kind of sort of see what the profit looks like, right? That's all. All right, so let's let's look at some uh, land exit projects, right? Uh, the first, we, this property, as some of you guys may have seen it, we bought it Q1 last year. It's a 17, 16.8, 17,000 square uh, footage of retail space in Austin area. When we bought it, uh, let me go back to the slide. Um, so we bought it, that, uh, the property, the, the owners, the sellers went through land purchase, zoning, and entitlement. Then they were out of money. I'm sorry, out of time. We bought it right at that. It was entitled property that we bought. Now we're going through, we went through site prep. We put the utilities. Now we're doing the construction. So let's see. So this is the project that was in January. Here we are, you know, 10 months down the way. This is the current status. Building went through, building is from together. So if we drive by today, up until four months ago, there was nothing, just a bunch of pipes. And last three, four months, we put together everything in a vertical. So when you go there today, uh, you can see the building, you can see the framework that looks like pictures uh, that we have put together before. And uh, sorry, that's go back out. That looks like this. So, and uh, again, we didn't put the, uh, the brick facade yet. Uh, it's right now, it looks like that pretty you know, basic, but as maturity happens, you'll see the carbs and everything else start, you know, will start showing up. So that's one of the examples. We went straight to the construction. Uh, we bought that after zoning, right? 
second project uh, that's in Houston. Uh, this is in the Acre Homes. Uh, one of my one of my friend Ryan is here. Uh, it's Ryan and us. We're working together. Uh, this is this is the location in Houston. It, uh, it it was a pure land play when the land was acquired. This is what that land. It was 17 tracks. We have a bunch of options. We went through option one. We looked at apartments. It was just fine. But then architect told us after thirteen thousand later I mean, dollars down the way, it's a fantastic apartment, but we have to acquire these assets. Then it's a perfect site for a inner city development. We went and then we saw this one, two, four, and that those four tracks are owned by City of Houston Land Bank, Laura. We went to Laura, we said, Can we buy it? We're gonna build a nice apartment there. City comes out and said that about three weeks ago, they gave these four lots to another builder to build four houses. To talk about timing and the money, right? We didn't know. That's so that option went away. Then we looked at individual houses. Then we looked at BTR. Then we looked at duplex and quadplexes. Market changed dramatically since in uh, in last two years. So we took a look at it and we said, okay, individual houses, interest rate is too high. Build to rent, same problem as individual houses. Interest rate is too high. It's not going to cash flow. Quadplex, pricing may be too high. And then we settled on duplex. And that's a financial product where the amount of money it takes to buy a half a million dollar home, it's way more than the money it needs to buy a duplex for the same dollar size because one of the units counts as rental income. So you're really paying half of the house and 3% of that if your house like our VA, it's a very low, very less amount of capital needed in today's market to buy a such expensive home. And then on the side, you have a rental income coming up at the same time. That came up with this product. And then the timing perspective, uh, the, the landowner wanted to write about the land. We could not push that forward because we needed some know-how about the construction. That's where the partnership came in. Ryan is here. He's a home builder. He's been doing it quite a bit in the in Houston area, mostly in the inner city. He's been there, done that. When, when we structured the partnership, his skill set about the construction, going back to the circle, then ours in our funding, we decided to go to the zoning and that. So this is the concept looks like. Uh, we got four loans signed, so we, we should be breaking ground anytime soon. Uh, I mean, really, really soon, and that's there. So this is what the concept looks like, duplex, two-story, very simplified, you park in the front, so cost reduction has been happened, cost efficiency has been picked up, and uh, kind of kicked in. We hired a and a good construction team. That's what they do, bread and butter. They build single family homes. And then it, it's a row house, but it's a beautiful look, right? And we looked at some of the concepts there. As you can see, uh, our concept from where we at on the Corai Street, what the other streets are, uh, the price point we're seeing, $207 a square foot versus our price, way cheaper than that. And so it, it gave us an, an a confidence level look. We're going to build a product looks like this that goes way over you know 260 dollars a square foot and but we're going to sell it at a 200 bucks a square foot right so so that's where the arbitrage is and uh, that's where this is the concept and this is where some sample cases we have done so we feel comfortable about doing this project and all of them together row by row now downside those are all full recourse loans bank will not give you loans for all 10, 20 at a time. So you may have to run two or three banks loans at the same time. You gotta have the financial power to do a design like that. So going back to the point, having a team that has the right balance sheet, right liquidity. Uh, I have been there, done that. Concept is very important before you even do anything, right? And that's where the trap happens on a land. Most of the land that we see that doesn't work where, hey, I have a, company I'm running or have a W2, the concept is really good. I just bought the land. Now I need to figure out what to do with it. But when I bought it, I missed something or I paid too high. So I'm stuck in between, right? It's sad, but it is what it is. Now, only thing you have, you wait and see when the price goes up, right? So land is great, makes a lot of sense. You can have a lot of upside, but you got to know when you go about it. Otherwise, a lot of rabbit holes, expensive rabbit holes that we have to go through. So that's the second example, right? You have a land, we waited, we ran through all the concepts, then we designed the duplex, it checks the financial box, 
it checks the price box, it checks a product that is positioned nicely to compete with the high-end product at the hand for the high price product within a mile from there. All right. Let's look at another one. Retail. This is a classic example of one of the land thing we can do. You can follow the bigger development. This is one of the projects that we have. Those are all listed about almost 6,000 homes. Uh, phase one, two, three already sold. Phase four lands are being sold. We had phase five ish right here, phase five right here. That is being, you know, the roads are being put together. And this is the lake, most expensive section of the whole thing. And then you can see the whole subdivision needs a destination for service center. It's right here. You'll see as you drive by every major development, more than a couple of thousand homes, they, they get followed by apartments. And between the apartments and the houses, you need and you know, your you know local nail salon, dentist, then your Chinese place, and your taco place in your smaller gym, and that's what we're gonna do here. We have 300 units, almost 200 to 280 units, brand new apartment, class A, between the houses and the apartments. There's a small slot open right here, and that's what we're gonna build at the retail center. Now, we decided to buy the land. That's because we know the uh, zoning, we are confident about the permitting. We know how to build these uh, retail centers. We have done it. And we also know the construction. So all the boxes were checked. Hence, we bought the land right away. So that's there. That's like your third uh, case study as you go. Let me use a uh, fourth one. I shared this before. This is an industrial play. We bought the land. We went through three revisions of it. After about $30,000 down the way, uh, we settled on this design and we checked all the boxes out. The land price was about almost a million. We spent another $30,000 just to go through the study hiring and get the geotech survey, bring in the architect, get the civil, get the measurements around 30. And then, then where we at? And revisions will happen. So if you, you know, whenever we get into the land development, it's a slow paced, a lot of things will go wrong, kind of sort of thing, and you have to weave your you know, kind of way through. That's the beauty of the land development. Again, this is the industrial slash you know, a retail play. So entitlement has a value. If it would be just the flex space, entitlement would not have that much of a value. So that's there. That's your fourth you know, example as you can talk through. And um, you know, it has the LOI pending for 1.9 million. So that's that's one of the thing, right? So we have we talked about land, purely as land with the flex space, BTR or a whole street of BTRs uh, or build to sell, we call it BTS. And then we also talked about you know, retail centers. Now let me show you even bigger scale. All right, so from the ticket size perspective, just to let you know, uh, this one that we talked about, this one, the land alone was a little over 2 million. Uh, this land, a little over half a million. And this tract land alone, it's almost five million. And less, and this land was a million. It takes money, and about two out of those last three deals did not have a debt on it. It was pure cash flow, because you know you got to go a long way. And we tried to put a very thoughtful way to kind of put the debt together. And then this one that we have, this is the retail town center. Uh, right by Ellison. If you live in the you know, KD area, you can drive by by FM 529 and Grand Parkway. Uh, you'll see this is the Grand Parkway right here. And FM 529, there's an exit. This is uh, what we call it. Uh, it's a retail town center. It's the destination-based town center that you can go. The land itself, it's about 23 million. Right. And one family office from Houston, they came in, they and we are acting as a turnkey developer for that one, which is they brought the money for the land. We brought the construction and leasing, and then they're going to you know, um, buy that out from us already. So our job is just to deliver the product at the end, build it for them. So that um, the family office funded this deal. They have done quite a bit of deals with Realty One. So they have seen Realty One in action. Realty One have done quite a bit of projects in KD area. So we know uh, this area. And between those two, they wanted to do a certain type of project. So they came in and cut those big checks uh, and that funded this project. If we drive by today, you'll see about seven months ago, there was nothing. 
Now, right now we have buildings going on. Uh, this is the fastest I've seen that we put in 18 miles of underground piping in less than three months. That was an impressive undertaking and execution on that side of it, like 18 miles of underground piping, one of the best thing I've seen. And then, so those are all the things that are happening. Now the question is, let's look at the timeline perspective, what else are working? This is another project we are scoping out right now for 2025, end of 2025 and or 2026. And this is 2024. It takes years to get to those projects. The reason being is that this project, let's say they already have houses built and the project before they have houses built, but here houses are not being built yet, right? This is about 40 acres of um, somewhere in the Katy area. Can't talk about the name yet. Uh, it's a town center. It's like a small version of Katy town center or Woodlands uh, town center where you have 8,000, 9,000 homes. They gotta go somewhere. They don't have the time to go to city. Uh, they got the lake and the town center and the you know the whole center piece right there. So we are working with the um, the development company as they're designing the houses. We are designing the town centers and each of the buildings initial play. Typically, this here it costs you money just to kind of get in because as we sat down with them, we are funding our architects' time, we are funding our civil engineers' time, and we are also using our time. So those are some of the long drawn out project that we have to look ahead of time, two, three years out and start working on it. Uh, in return, the landowner, they're saying, you get to buy this project, help me build something that matches my in a major subdivision so I can flow uh, our traffic of the homeowners into your area that becomes a destination based um, project. So, so a, a, uh, that's all we had today, and I can stop and go for some Q&A. But we just wanted to share that land, you know, land development is a major wide exercise, right? We have a lot of, do. I mean, there's tons of different ways we can do things. So when you invest in a land development play, our land development play should be in your portfolio. It's a very good way to de-risk some of the portfolio that you have. Land play is a good one. Zoning and, and entitlement is that, and the construction. One of the beautiful things that we targeted the this side of it, because when we look into adding, when we looked into adding a class A portfolio, um, and uh, within a massive capital team, we were competing with institutional money, right? Uh, from the LP side as well. So then we kind of took the side. We said, look, you know what? We're not going to compete on the buy side. We're going to compete on the construction side, and then we kind of came in, and that's where the realty one massive partnership became. Uh, really um, awesome. That's where we get to play with our strength. And at a construction, we are we are doing the construction at a manufacturer price. Even though things go sideways, you have room to breathe, right? And that's the beauty of uh, coming into the construction if you know it and if, if you can manage the control, um, if you can control the cost, uh, most of your investment. So as an LP investor, you should have some investment at the land, if you ask us, or we have land investments uh, as a land bank, but a good chunk of us, it's on the construction of money that we spend. That's because all of a sudden from the back end, you're adding a triple net or class A uh, assets in your portfolio. And then on top of that, you can couple that with the value add. So you, uh, our portfolio behaves very much nice way. We have early exits, we have long exits, we have you know, velocity of money, versus the cash flow of money. Uh, we have some assets give you a higher return with no depreciation, some assets get you depreciation. So it's a balanced portfolio rather just following one strategy one way every day. So that's all I had today. And uh, I'll, I'll take some questions. Uh, now, before I go, I know Ryan, you're here, right? Ryan, would you mind do a quick, quick intro and how many of these projects you're doing and uh, where do you play mostly, if you don't mind, please? Hey everyone, my name is Ryan. I'm a local Houston real estate investor. Uh, I do some multifamily investing as well as I've been doing the duplexes since 2000, I think 19 was my first duplex. Uh, I just I just sold three uh, recently. Um, and then Shriar brought this land to me and he was like, hey, what do you what do you think? And he, he showed me multiple parcels and we were looking at this other parcel first and I was like, okay, look, this, this one works better. And so we have been working on it for quite a while. We had to replat a little bit of it. Um, 
And then, you know, we got five, we have a master plan with the city of Houston now that took, took a little while to get through. And then, like you said, we just closed five loans. We have dirt at the lot. And so we'll start with the first five duplexes. Uh, this is going to be like a build to sell. Uh, and so these type of projects, you know, if, if it would, it would, it took a while just through the city, but let's say we buy a lot and it's like ready to go, no replat needed. I mean, you could probably be in and out in six months, but this one probably took almost a year to even break ground. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And look, it's a specialty, right? How many total houses you built up until now? Last year and a half, two years. Uh, since 2019, you know, over 20 houses, and then, but you know, probably over the next, over the next two years, I mean, I'll probably do just 25 at least over the next two years. So, so uh, just you could you see, know, yeah. So it's a build-up process. You have to get the right people in place, and uh, you know, people that I'm using now, I didn't use in 2019. Yeah. yeah. And and on the, what I heard from Ryan is I made the circle twenty five times. <laughs> yeah. right? so you made the circle twenty five times. Now you are twenty six times. It gets better. And then it was one or two houses. Now it's a 10, 20, 30 at a time. Your cycle gets much faster. Your team gets much wiser. But it 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 just takes time. Nothing is easy, right? So right. cool. For sure. Uh, let me let me stop sharing and I'll, I'll be open up first. So let me see some of the questions we may have. Uh, someone asked, oh, let me see, uh, hold on. I saw a chat. Uh, David, thank you. Is there any place I can, that's a lot. Uh, it's typically for massive masters. Uh, we, we use all the tools and walk you guys through. Those are in-house built into some of the system that we have. So it's tough to take one out, then we, sh you know, go out. And within the tools, we have our pre-baked assumptions, um, uh, that we use to kind of make those circle. That changes quite a bit. Uh, so it's nothing that we, I mean, yeah, it's it's nothing that we can share. But if you have something, shoot, shoot me an email. We can give you some feedback. Uh, that's where we are. Cool. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. And look, we don't mind, but tool is one thing. And the number that goes in, that's another thing. And how they extrapolate each other, that's, that's another another thing, right? And so we leverage um, Bo. Uh, Bo is our construction side. Uh, him and I, we run mostly the land acquisition and the construction side. Uh, but that's a lot of conversation happens over text, over things, tough. Unless you are in that underwriting mode with us all the time, it is just tough, right? Yep, cool. Now, uh, thank you, David. So let me give you another example where thing goes south quick and where you are not in control. Uh, we had four acres under contract right at the tail end of the COVID, the land price just made sense. We went through the whole uh, hiring the top end farms. It was about 320 units, five story wrap, class A beautiful building, energy corridor. It just slammed up. $73 million deals were going in. Interest rate went from a three to a 12. Doesn't matter what we did, we're not in the money. Right, so we had to cut the cord. We said, okay, we're gonna let go of our total cost around sixty thousand dollars, and we walked away. We walked away happy because we have seven partners, less than ten grand a piece. Worked out, and so that's the type of partnership we need to put together. And one side is great. If that project would have been kicked in, if the interest rate would have been where it is now, and you know, down the way five, five and a half, and would have done the same thing one more time. At the price point, uh, the total profitability of the project was tens of millions of dollars. But the interest rate ate the lunch, dinner, breakfast, everything else. So that's not in our control, right? And not in our control in a in a by any means. So sometimes it is okay to walk away, live for another day. So you protect investor money. On that note, most of our, I mean almost all of our soft cost money comes from our own pocket. We don't bring in investor money to put them at a risk uh, up front. So when you get into a Intel land and tell me something like that, uh, as, a, as an investor, you get to ask who's bringing the soft money. Then go sideways, deal doesn't happen. Whose money is it that is in the works? If it is investors, you should know it's high risk. If it's not, you're in a better spot. So we tend to invest with our own money uh, to get to the entitlement process. And then we trigger the loan and the uh, investor money. So it gets you know, nicely adjusted by the risk. So good question, David. Thank you. All right, let me see who else got questions. There was a lot today that I uh, share with you guys and you, you almost have some uh, questions. Come on. Hey, hello. Thanks for joining. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so Diane, uh, so soft money set the foundation of the deal. It's the second layer of money. The first one is the land acquisition. Second one is the soft and then everything else. Uh, so it's not quite, it, it's one of the pillars of the foundation. I would say it's one of the good chunk of the foundation. Uh, there we go. Overall, this uh, the soft money has the highest risk, but this is the smallest amount. And that's usually the case. I'll give an example. The land, one of the land we're looking on, one of the land that we bought is five and a half million dollars. The soft money, it's about three hundred to four hundred thousand uh, dollars. So the land is five, but the soft money, let's say half a million, right? Five hundred. From the ratio perspective, it's very, it's in one tenth. But the project itself, it's about seven million. So from the total money needed, your soft money, it's small. But on the downside perspective, soft money has the most amount of risk, right? So, yep, that's one of the pillars. That's right. That's what it is. Good question. Uh, one thing I would kind of point out is with like these urban in, like I do a lot of urban infill lots where we're not buying a huge parcel. So you can't put it under contract and sit on it for three months while you're doing all this research and stuff. Really, I mean, you have to pull the trigger pretty quick on the lot. And so, you know, I've, I've gotten burned before personally where, you know, you give $5,000 to some wholesaler, you lock up the lot, and then you start doing your research, and then you can't do what you want to do with it. And so there's there's a risk that happened to me recently, uh, but I knew it was a risk. Um, and so you really have to know your areas um, and have the right vendors, because if you put a lot under contract and now you're shopping vendors and you can't find the right person, um, then, you know, that, that can cause some problems for sure. 100%. Yeah. It happened to us all the time, right? Some of the scars and burns are real. Money goes out the door quick. So when you buy it, be be technical about it, think it through, put the team together, and be happy when you don't do a deal, right? Walking away, well, sometime, most of the time, it's the best thing you have done on the deal, right? So yeah, it's good. What are you working on, Ron? Anything else you're working on recently in the inner city? Uh, just just more just buying more more lots really buy more lots and you know kind of land banking basically land banking for future projects yes uh so al you asked the question about the different skill set needed their team yes so you went to the like a, this is like a secondary layer of the detail the initially you need to have someone let's say you know we're gonna do we're gonna build 10 houses in the inner city and the acre homes area uh, to think about the first layer is someone needs to fund the deal. Which is, let's say it's me. Someone has to know the how of doing the construction. It's Ryan. And then between us, we got to figure out who is our replat. We look at our roller decks. Okay, okay we know that uh, you know attorney or the civil engineer who can do the replat. And then on that note, we need to do a construction. Then we ask the question, what type of construction company we're going to hire? Do they have civil or do they have with it or they don't? Or who's going to do my uh, the design? So the architect, do they know any civil? Do they work together? If they do, it's great. And then some architect doesn't do permitting. So you got to put together an architect, a civil engineering firm, and a permitting just to get the permitting. And then you got to ask, look, uh, uh, for an architect, they don't really care how you build the building. They really, only thing they do care is how pretty it looks, right? So you got to bring in a construction team and they have to test their design from the construction perspective. Because trust me, every two by four counts. So you got to have the construction crew who has been on, you know, been doing it all the time. They know what the optimal way of doing it. And then they can provide the feedback to the architect and then architect provide the feedback to civil, build your package and you go through your permitting process, right? And then, you know, if you want to go a little bit down, I can go to a builder construction team that are building 20 houses. They are different than someone's building 50 houses because scalability and speed matters. or someone's building entry-level home or someone building a high-end home. So you got to take a look who's doing what, who's doing how much, who's doing what at price point, and then find something closer to you who has a high velocity, which is you are not their top customer. You are the middle, if not less of the middle. So you're not taking much of a risk on their execution. It's a little bit more thinking it through as you kind of go. So the partner that we brought it in for the construction team, they're building over 100 houses a year. We're building 10. We're one tenth of it. We're risk. We're leveraging that. That's as you go. Okay. I mean, usually what we say when you build a, if your project builds a company over 20, 25%, you are putting them on a bankruptcy risk. 
because they have to grow the team instantaneously with their project 25, 30%. And then the working capital, the hiring, the firing, the process and the training, everything has to happen for your project. Hence, you are in a back end risk of it. So think it through. And as the project gets bigger, it gets more important as you do it. Good question. Again, I, I'm, I'm going kind of detail into it. That's because those are good to know as an investor. So you can kind of sort of decide, you can ask meaningful questions. And you know, that's one of the uh, purpose of this uh, this session. Okay. Uh, tax break. Uh, it's a write-off, that's for sure. And if you, it, it doesn't, I mean, whoever you know, pays for it, they get a write-off, it's a loss. So yes, you do. Uh, it's a, you know, depending on the tax bracket, you get a write-off for that one, yes. Uh, we always say, uh, it's a, we are a for-profit company and we're here to make, create you know, values for everyone else. That's rule number one. And rule number two, as Buffett said, don't forget the rule number one, right? And then you kind of go from there. Yes, yeah, sometimes will happen, by the way. Sometimes we'll, we'll, you know, uh, we'll buy something and I bought it, uh, some of the assets that we thought there was a smaller chunks, but there was money and we went in uh, that we couldn't do anything. We, we, we missed something. Right, then what we have to do, we have to wait and then let the market write the whole thing. One of the beautiful things is land is if you do it decent and you can wait, you'll be all right. Price is not going down. It's gonna catch back up as long as you have staying power. Right. So you'll see that's why uh, some of the folks, even though you know you paid 10%, 20% more, then you're stuck with it. True. But if you can go to bed and wake up three years from now and then sell it, you still go, you know, kind of in the money. That's right. That's right. As long as you can hold it. So if you go for the big assets and you got a debt and it doesn't make money, that's like a double price. Uh, so if you just buy something with a bunch of friends, free and clear, you buy the whole thing cash, then you can hold on it. Uh, it's going to behave like a CD. That means you may not get the cash flow, but your risk is very much protected. Uh, so it'll be okay on the upside. But my, uh, I'll give you my story. The first, uh, no, the second, the first piece of track that I bought 2018 and I sold it, uh, I made some good profit, at least in my mind, still a good profit. Uh, so I doubled down on the second one. So I bought uh, one property in Independent Heights uh, by the Live Oak Bayou. So wholesaler sent me, I loved it, price makes sense, I bought it. And I drove by the property. Uh, the, some, of, some of you guys know about it, but I'll and I'll repeat that. So I drove by the property. I saw, I didn't see the bayou, but I knew there was a bayou, right? I didn't walk on the land. I just drove by and I saw halfway middle of the property, a bunch of, bunch of bushes, right? I said, no big deal. I know a guy who can you know, come out and clean that and a lot as you go. I looked at the FEMA flood map. It's blue and uh, no big deal. Bought it. Then I said, okay, I'm, this is my first time I'm gonna attempt a permitting on it just to see what it feels like. I go to city and I said, okay, let's do it. And as a prep for the city, I send my land, uh, my lot clearing crew to go out there clean the and lot. So he goes out there. It's a, what, almost 5,500 square foot lot. Yeah, 5,500 square foot lot. It takes him about three, four hours. So he went there in the morning. He called me like after 30 minutes. He says, hey, sure, I'm done. Send me the money. I'm thinking, there's no way it's going to be done in like 40 minutes. There's no way. It's just not possible. Then I was like, look, Robert, what happened, man? Why are you done so early? He said, yeah, I, I cleaned up the lot. And he sent me a picture. I'm looking at it. I was like, doesn't make sense. He cleaned a little bit. Then he calls me and said, look, you know that half of your lot is missing. I was like, what the hell does that mean? Half of my lot is missing. So what happened, it's a 5,000 square foot lot and the bayou eroded my lot away. I have only half of the lot and there was a bush. I didn't know see the other lot was missing. So I got half of the lots and have back, back of the lot has been eroded out. So I go to city, I said, hey, I'm gonna dump some you know, dart in there, done. Neighbors find out my phone number, she calls. Like, sure, I don't know who you are, but don't do this. You're gonna get a lot of fine. I freaked out because I bought that property all cash. It was back in the days, $130,000. I brought in a friend of mine because I thought I knew it. Then I was like, oh my goodness. So uh, I go to the flood map, call some of the people. They said, look up the flood map. It's in the flood way. It's even worse. Then I was like, how did I make a mistake? The flood zone, 100 years, 500 years in a flood way. 
Uh, back in the days, it used to be light shadow blue and dark shadow blue. In this case, light and dark overlapped. So I thought that's a light shadow blue, but that's a dark shadow blue. So I made a mistake. So I bought a property that has half of the plot, other half is missing, and it's in the floodway. So I cannot do anything. I was like, oh, dang. So that was my the worst one I bought but made me other side the best person to buy land. I studied all the FEMA rules. I became like one of the good friends of this, uh, the, the flood, uh, flood pad designer or the water flow designer of, or water flow engineer of the city of Houston. And then finally, we found a way to get it out. So I think after a bunch of uh, meetings, the engineer goes, Sharar, sure, you're looking at things wrong. I was like, what do you mean? You're looking at things from the top down that how are we gonna fill the in the land, how are you gonna build the house? But look at sidewise. That means this is your flood plain. This is where you're building a house. That means build the house just like you're gonna build the house in Galveston. For first floor, nothing. Your second and third floor, your house begins. And your first floor is your garage. Then you're gonna step down to the bayou for a hangout spot. After spending so much time on the book, talking to so many people. Then we hired an architect. We designed a beautiful three-story building with a two and a half car garage with a step down to the bayou with the second and the third floor with the balcony, beautiful view. Then we were able to sell it. it took us three years. I still made money. I sold it for like almost 250 grand. Uh, but the amount of study went in to save me out of that hole, we learned so much to become a better land buyer. Going back, the point is, don't be bullish on the land if you think uh, you don't know. Find somebody else. Yeah, money goes out the door really, really quick. But on the other side, if you can wait, if you can have a holding power, you should be on the other side. Okay. It's going to take a little bit of time. So, yeah, then sometimes it is just like that. You know, I, know I, I bought houses, I, similar thing. I drove by. And then after I closed, I sent my crew out and my, you know, uh, my construction guy calls me, he's furious. He was like, all the numbers I gave you to all wrong. I was like, what do you mean? Then he asked, did you look at the house? I said, yeah. Then I was like, why don't you come down again? I go to, and I'll see the house. So again, I drove by, it's, it's a lot of bushes around it, you know, icing looks good. But what happened is that house, three sides of the wall were missing. Bushes were so high, I didn't see it. So when you cut it, you know, it, it, you could see the whole house. So the whole house at the front and the front roof, back roof was missing and two sides are missing. But I bought it at land value, worked out. But sometimes it gets really tricky. So we got stories around it. So walk all the properties, put your eyes on it, look at the slope, get some boots, walk inside it, see if they're in a bayou or not, look at the map, call some people. Then you go buy a land, especially outside the city. Yeah, and something I even learned recently, uh, once I started working with the new plat guys, I do I do something called if you if you're in the city of Houston at least, but I'm sure probably most entities have this. Is I use a, a certain title company and I order a city planning letter, and they go in and they just it, it's almost like it's basically he opens title on the property, but not for a sale, just for research purposes. Pulls all the documents, gets all the boundaries, all the setbacks everything and you can show it to an architect and a replat person and say hey what do you think of this that just that is 350 dollars, which is nothing right so i would rather blow 350 dollars than buy a two hundred thousand dollar bad lot that i can't do anything um so the 200 the, the 350 now has saved me multiple times on that on that where I've, I've ordered that it takes a week to come back and you can really look at all the information versus just guessing well 100 percent, right so let me all right. 